everyone. My name is Travis Rector, and I'm a professor of physics and astronomy at the University of Alaska Anchorage. And I'm also one of the organizers for Astronomers for Planet Earth, a group that is helping astronomers to address the issues of climate change. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Francesca Fragudi, who is currently a postdoctoral fellow at European Southern Observatory in Germany. And this is the Q&A session to discuss uh, her talk, which uh, is if you're if you're watching the recording this on YouTube, there is a link to it in the uh, in the comment section. So if you haven't seen it, you can go ahead there. Uh, but in her talk, she talked about a really amazing project that she's working on called the Columba Hypatia Project, which is uh, a project that is intended to help uh, bring uh, groups together of people on Cyprus that normally don't get together through the interest and enthusiasm for astronomy. So Francesca, thank you for joining us today. And thank so uh, thank you for coming. So um, for those of you who are joining us live, please feel free to, uh, if you have a question you'd like to ask, feel free to either type it into the chat session or you can raise your hand and, and you can ask your question live. So uh, I'd like to go ahead and start by, uh, first off, I really enjoyed your video. I thought it was really amazing to hear about your project. And so the first and most obvious question really is, what can, what can uh, we as astronomers learn from the project you've been doing and, and how, that, how can that apply to our work in addressing climate change? Because in listening to your talk and listening about these two groups that historically or, you know, have been separated and, and you know, are deeply entrenched in, in their and their opposition towards each other because of you know historical reasons, and also just um, cultural differences. I just kept thinking back to, uh, especially here in the United States, where we have such a battle between two very separated groups as well. Not only you know, uh, you know, on the issue of climate change, but you know, culturally and uh, even geographically. So, so what are what are the um, uh, what are the lessons you think? How can, how can we learn from what your project has been doing and how can that inform us in helping to bring uh, these two uh, separate groups together in helping to address climate change? Yeah, so um, I think probably the kind of, you know, for me, the main takeaway from the project was, um, and I mentioned this in the talk, of course, is how... Um, you know, powerful astronomy is for helping us to um, build bridges between um, people of different backgrounds. And, uh, you know, we, we see this also, we've seen this within um, the context of also other projects that we've run with Galileo Mobile in different regions of the world. So, um, you know, also uh, we, we had a project where we um, uh, carried out astronomy activities in uh, different countries in uh, South America and also in India. Um, and what we saw is that it's just a really great way of getting people, you know, around the table to sit down and just have a chat because um, astronomy is such a common kind of interest that people have. And this idea of trying to understand where we come from, how, you know, uh, why we're here, all of these questions that astronomy kind of um, deals with is something that's really deeply ingrained in us in people and people have a lot of interest in this and so it's just a great way to get people together as a first way to kind of start discussing and getting to know each other and then in particular in the context of the Kumbai uh, Badia project which is you know set more in a post-conflict region where you have some kind of recent conflict um, where there's let's say some distrust and some uh, stereotypes uh, that are, you know, preconceived stereotypes and some barriers between people. Um, apart from, you know, the unifying theme of astronomy, which is something that everyone is interested in and, 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 and wants to know more about, it was also, you know, a really great way to kind of get everyone also thinking about, um, you know, our place in the universe and, and, and this idea of, global citizenship and how I think when we have this perspective of astronomy, um, you know, conflicts and all, you know, these things that are happening between people take a bit of a, are put into context, at least, I think, in, in, in that kind of global perspective of, of how, you know, fragile Earth is and how, um, you know, fragile our civilizations are even, 
Um, and so I think that helps to put things into perspective and gets people in kind of a more open mind frame, maybe also for hearing out different perspectives. And then in particular for the post-conflict context, I think this was particular, because you could say, oh, well, why don't you, instead of using astronomy, why don't you just, you know, bring people together and do something else? Um, for example, you know, over music or, you know, over shared, in, another shared interest. Um, but I think what was really great about the astronomy part was that um, it was a way to bring people together that might not normally want to um, engage in these kinds of, um, let's say, peace building efforts or in Cyprus, what we call them bicommunal kind of efforts where you bring people from the two communities together because there's a lot of hesitancy and, and there's a lot of, um, yeah, like mistrust and that kind of thing. But because it was such an exciting subject, it was something that, um, we, we did this obviously a lot in schools and so teachers were really interested in getting um, their um, students to be more involved in STEM subjects um, that that really got people to be really you know got them to come together and got them to engage in in the first part with the project which often often is the hardest part I mean um, you know often just getting people to start discussing is, is really the first step to kind of resolving any kind of conflict and getting people to know each other and to learn about each other. And the activities that we carried out were in such a way that um, we kind of encouraged um, not only you know, for them to learn about astronomy, but also to start learning a bit more about each other um, and to start discussing a bit and, and see you know, each other's point of view about things or um, you know, different cultural aspects. So, so I think it's twofold. It's basically the, 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 the theme of astronomy is really unifying, I think, in itself and, and um, really gives this global perspective, but also the topic is something that is really good at bringing people together because people are really interested in the topic as well and it really engages people. So it's a really great starting point, starting point for you know, subsequent discussions, I think. Great. Uh, William, I see you have your hand up. So if you'd like to, uh, go ahead and ask a question, please do. Yeah, um, yeah, <clears throat> I have a lot to say, but I, I'll limit myself for the for the beginning anyway. Um, so, I mean, in general, this organization, Astronomers for Earth, is inspiring, and Travis himself is is an inspiration for starting and, and running this group. But the speakers we have are always inspiring, and I think that especially applies to you. I mean, you've used Carl Sagan as an inspiration, and I'm going to be using Inspire a lot in, in, this, in this little blurb here, but uh, he's uh, clearly inspired you. Uh, you've quoted from the pale blue dot about how um, astronomy and the immensity of the universe should teach us to value our Earth and, and value each other. Um, and you've put that into action, which is great. I mean, promoting peace between two groups with a history of enmity and, and, and even violence. And uh, I'm really impressed by that. Um, I'm inspired by that. Astronomy has this power to bring us all together, as you've been saying repeatedly. And that's the, and you, as I said, you put that into action, and you've understood that better than most. Um, <clears throat> so you inspire me, and I, I would say it's safe to say you've inspired countless others. You and your group, uh, the Astronomy for Peace. And for now, I'll, I'll limit myself just to one simple question before doing the other questions later on. Um, uh, I understand why your programs and activities are directed towards children. That, that makes sense. Um, you did briefly mention certain activities for adults like lectures. Um, could you elaborate on those or any other activities you have for adults? Yeah, so, uh, well, first of all, thanks a lot for those um, really beautiful word, words. Um, so yeah, we did also um, yeah, carry out activities for adults. So. The, of course, the, the, the idea was, you know, um, I, I know it's also difficult to, um, I know I didn't give too much context about the situation in Cyprus, and that's because it's so um, complex and po politically loaded that I didn't want to kind of go into too much detail there. Um, I, I think it's just important to say that, you know, the, the two communities of Cyprus were, um, you know, living in peace for many, many years, and um, it's um recent conflicts in the history uh, of the island that have kind of driven this division um, between people. Um, so, you know, we do know that people, of course, can, um, you know, have, you know, thrive to living together. And that's, that's something that's 
people are trying to do now, again, more and more at various levels in society. So from grassroots efforts to kind of, you know, the um, higher up politically, which is of course very complicated. Um, so, and one of the reasons we wanted to kind of focus on the on, on children is because um, for, for, for older generations, um, they, a lot of them, um, you know, lived through the times either of before the conflict um, and actually had, you know, new people from, you know, people from both sides were friends, knew each other. Then there's this generation that lived through the conflict and is quite, is very loaded, you know, it's, it's emotionally very loaded for them to, to engage um, a lot in these activities. But of course, the younger generations like myself and, and younger, you know, we, ne we never lived through the conflict. So, so we um, grew up in, in a context where um, Turkish Cypriots were in the north and Greek Cypriots were in the south. I was always, you know, and, and the division is there everywhere. I mean, you know, there's, um, you have the, the Green Line, the United Nations controlled Green Line, which is running through the island. And, um, you know, there's a, you know, there's places where you, you go, for example, in my home uh, town of Nicosia, where you, you're just going through the old city and then you some, you suddenly come upon like basically a barricade where you can't go anymore and you know that that's you know the other side and there's always i think there's a lot of um uh you know i think in in my generation we, there was a, a lot of curiosity also about what happened and and it's not really discussed in our education system it's not really gone they, they don't go into much depth about what happened it's a very also biased and skewed perspective about uh, of, of the history of what happened in cyprus um and a lot of it never really added up i think to a lot of people of my generation like a lot of it didn't quite make sense um and there was a very polarizing them against us narrative often um and so i think that yeah, so, so, so sorry, going, going very, a long way around just to get back to your question. The reason why I think we wanted to um, first, you know, um, to, to focus more on children is that, first of all, they're, of course, you know, very, um, they haven't been through this um, very brainwashing, let's say, education system, yeah. at least that we have in, in, in Cyprus. Um, um, and, you know, are still, you know, open, I think, to, to kind of understanding the other, the other side and the other perspective. Um, and then, so, but of course, we also did want to reach out to, to adults as much as possible. The problem with reaching out to adults is that usually you're um, preaching to the choir, preaching to the converted. So, so the ones who usually come to the activities are those who are already a, usually right. a bit more open um, to these kinds of things. We did, um, we did get um, some people to come to the activities. So we had some activities in the United Nations controlled buffer zone um, for adults, which were, um, we had yeah, stargazing parties and lectures. And they, we also had um, uh, one of the nights, we also had live music um, associated to the event as well. And, um, you know, most of the people that come to that area of the island in the United Nations controlled buffer zone are usually people who are already a bit more open to the concept of kind of bicommunal efforts and peace building. Um, but we did get some people that came that were, you know, maybe more interested in the astronomy part that wouldn't have usually come. Um, right. And also the, um, the um, astronomy organization. So we worked with some of the amateur astronomer clubs on the island as well. And, um, you know, they don't all necessarily have the same political views. And so that was also great to get those people involved. And we also managed to connect a lot of amateur astronomers from the north and the south, um, which was really, you know, cool because now we see these new kind of collaborations happening between between them as well. Um, and you know, there's not many astronomers in Cyprus or even amateur astronomers. So so it was, you know, a way to kind of for them also to increase, you know, the, the amount of people that they can work with and kind of lobby for astronomy because they're very passionate about astronomy, even though there isn't much of that. Um, in Cyprus, also on a on a so, on a professional so this, level, uh, preaching preaching to the choir problem that you mentioned, it seems that, mm. that what you're doing with astronomy actually helps you get around that a little bit because you'll have people who don't necessarily want to socialize with the other side, but they're so interested in the astronomy they may show up anyway. So that that might yeah, help. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So there were people that that definitely came that wouldn't have normally come because they were interested in the astronomy part. Um, but obviously the reach when you, you know, when you go into schools, you're reaching a much more diverse set of, you know, kids from a much more diverse set of backgrounds. 
um, right. and and you know you, so you're you're sampling the population a bit better. Whereas I think with the adult events, you know, you get a lot of people that are already kind of leaning towards those ideologies, and then you get a few that are also more interested in the astronomy part that you know will come along, but. It, it, yeah, you, you don't, I think you get a more diverse population when you go into the schools. So yeah, we definitely got people that were not um, necessarily really into the bi-communal stuff and the peace building stuff. Um, but yeah, we did want to focus more on the children. So you have lectures, you had star parties and a little bit of music doesn't hurt. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and those, those events, um, yeah, went, went down um, quite well and um, people were really interested also in the lectures part and the star parties part and and yeah they were also very joyous events so that was that was okay. nice okay, thanks so i'll i'll ask a question that <clears throat> was uh put on the the youtube uh chat by leo bircher which is related to what you've been talking about and that is uh, with the kids he had two questions the first is uh, how do you have uh two groups of kids that, that don't speak the same language um how did they get to know each other and interact and, and his second question was, is, uh, you mentioned they beca became friends in the workshop. Uh, was there an opportunity for them to continue their friendship afterwards? Were they able to stay in touch and, and, and see each other again? Yeah, so yeah, of course, um, uh, there are, unfortunately the, the kids um, don't learn each other's languages. So, so Greek Cypriots speak a dialect of Greek, essentially, and Turkish Cypriots uh, speak a dialect of Turkish. Um, and, you know, I, I mentioned a little bit the education system and, you know, unfortunately, um, we don't learn each other's languages in school, which is really sad. Um, I actually wanted to learn um, Turkish was an option in high school. You could take that language as an optional language. And I think me and one other person signed up. And so they never uh, did the class, you know, created the class because there weren't enough people, um, which is, you know, really sad because those are the um, two of the three official languages on the island. And so we should be, I think, learning them. So, yeah, the kids don't. Um, so the young children don't speak in each other's languages. Um, the older children. So, so they were communicating mostly through the translators. But the great thing, of course, about, you know, if you have younger ages, like six, seven and eight, is that a lot of the communication also happens in a way like non-verbally from like playing football together in the breaks and like, you know, uh, play, you know, just kind of the, the activities are quite um, often like, um, you know, physical. We have a lot of um, icebreaker activities in the beginning, which are like games that are, you know, themed around astronomy, but um, are just to get the kids to kind of relax a bit and, and move around and stuff. So, um, you know, a lot of that for the younger ages is is good in a sense because even though they don't necessarily speak the same language they can communicate anyway and just you know kind of become friends anyway or they communicate with a few words also during the activities the way we um the way we structured them was that a lot of the things were happening a lot of the activities were like um about them learning things about each other so they would also learn words about each other so for example um I remember there was one time where these kids came up to me and they were like really excited because they'd learned the word for nose in Turkish. They were like, oh, you know, this, you know, and they were really excited about that. So they also get to learn a little bit, you know, and, and learn how to say hi in each other's languages and that kind of thing. Um, for the older kids, um, by the time they're about 10 or 11, they've done quite a bit of English at school because, um, you know, Cyprus was a, um, a former uh, British colony. So English is a very, um, it's very predominant, it's like very, predominant on the island um, so they do learn quite a lot of English we learn quite a lot of English early on so they start to be able to communicate also in English also for some of the younger kids sometimes they might come from you know they, they might have one parent that isn't um, uh, Cypriot or that is has another uh, mother tongue so sometimes they can also communicate in that way um, but yeah a lot of it was done uh, through the translators for the younger ones and and, and non-verbally and um, the other question was how if they stayed friends so so yeah we had i mean there was one time where um i remember there was this uh, a girl who came up to me and, and she was really upset because um she'd made a friend and her this friend didn't have facebook and she was like how am i going to keep in touch with her she doesn't have facebook um and i was like oh you can, you can exchange phone numbers <laughs> those still exist right <laughs> um 
but um yeah so a lot of the kids i think you know i mean i don't we didn't ever do a survey maybe maybe that's something we should have done was to kind of keep track of how things evolved but i think a lot of the kids um you know, maybe connected on social media, the ones that actually had social media accounts. Um, also, there are um, uh, other um, projects happening on the island with, uh, apart from the astronomy one, there are other kind of bicommunal projects that are happening on the island. So I know that some of, um, in particular, are the, so we have two implementing organizations. One is Galileo Mobile, which is like a science communication astronomy part of the project. And the other implementing organization is the Association for Historical Dialogue and Research, which is an NGO based in Cyprus that works kind of on, on peace building and uh, reevaluating, you know, historical perspectives and that kind of thing. And they, um, so AHDR, they, they run uh, also other projects on, on kind of peace building efforts. And um, I know that a, a lot of the kids um, have participated in some of the other projects as well. Um, and so some of them, you know, might have seen each other again through those projects. And um, actually, recently I was, um, so, I mean, there's been a lot kind of happening um, politically recently in Cyprus, but um, there's been a big effort. Um, so basically, since COVID started, the checkpoints where people were able to cross into the two sides were closed, you know, for, for health mm. reasons and COVID, mm. and, and COVID uh, which was of course a kind of politically also motivated decision, uh, I think to some extent. But um, so there's been, um, there hasn't been, you know, a lot of, it's been very difficult for people from, uh, from the two sides to cross, which is also uh, something that stalled our project. But um, there's been a lot of efforts from people who, uh, from the two sides, trying to do things um, together to kind of, you know, keep that spirit of, of peace building alive. And um, there's been a lot of social media campaigns that have been happening recently. And one was, um, there were a couple that were really fantastic. One was from young, so like from teens, youth. I mean, they looked, yeah, like I think they were teenagers. And they had this little video that they made where they said, oh, you know, politicians say we don't know each other. And so a solution would never work. Um, so let's, you know, let's show them. And they have the, all these photos coming up of like all these different interactions and things that are happening between, um, you know, of youths from the two sides and all these different events that they participated in and programs that they participated in. Um, and, you know, I saw like a couple of the kids that had participated in the project. So I don't know if they stayed in touch through that or if they stayed in touch through um, one of the other projects that happened on the island. But it does seem that, you know, the, especially the younger generation, um, I think through all these different kinds of initiatives, they have made links and, and you know, people are um, staying in touch and, you know, they're, they're really mobilizing also, you know, to, to push for peace. And that's just so super inspiring to see like that, that there's actually connections there between youth from the two sides. Um, yeah, so I, I, yeah, like I said, I, we'd never kept track of the kind of interactions, you know, how people continued um, talking, but from what I see, um, it does seem that there is, um, there is this bond between a lot of kids from the two sides and, and, and that, that's really fantastic to see. Oh, that's, that's great to hear. It's interesting because we often think of social media as something that polarizes people, but it of course can be used to, to bring different groups together as well. Uh, Laura, you, you've had your hand up for a while, so I wanted to give you a chance to ask you a, a question. Go right ahead. Hey, Francesca, how's it going? Hi, Laura. Uh, oh, sorry, I missed the talk. Confusion um, over of when it was. Um, and this may have been addressed, but I was curious as to whether you had been able to keep any virtual um, component going since the pandemic. And obviously, things are starting to open back up, obviously not quite as quickly as everyone would like in Europe. But do you have any plans for um, events when, when things do open back up? Yeah, so unfortunately, no, we didn't do anything online. And that was because, you know, well, first of all, the, the checkpoints. Um, okay, so when the checkpoints closed, we were like, well, this will be for a few months. So let's just postpone things for a few months. And then, you know, we'll start up again. And then obviously things dragged on and on. And um, but we didn't, you know, we didn't want to do anything online because um, as we mainly target I mean, the target as our main kind of group that we work with our children, it, it's really difficult to get, we couldn't really see how we could make it work in an online environment where they don't speak the same language. And, you know, we, we, we thought it would just be a bit too complex. And also, you know, you want to be a bit careful because you don't want the, 
you, you know, you don't want them to have a bad experience and then, you know, then it's kind of not worth it. You know, you want them to, to and, and that in-person, I think, experience is really, really important. I mean, we saw it a lot um, when we did the, the, the activities where like the kids would be really um, kind of like scared or worried about meeting each other. And then once they get together and they kind of see, oh, it's a real person and they're just like me and, you know, there's no, you know, there's nothing to be scared of. Um, and I think that you, it's not easy, as easy to get that in the online kind of interaction. So no, we didn't do anything. We did think about, you know, maybe doing something for, for adults online, but, you know, there's so much Zoom fatigue and, <laughs> and stuff these days that we were like, yeah, let's, we kept postponing it, hoping that things would open up. So, so I hope, I hope that we can start up again soon. Um, yeah. And, and about the future. Yeah. We, we are hoping that soon, I mean, there's, there's more and more pressure to kind of open up the checkpoints, especially now that um, cases are going down a lot and vaccination uh, programs are, are going ahead really well. Um, so we do hope that we'll be able to uh, to resume soon. And um, I mean, there's a number of other kind of projects up in the air, um, but we're basically there are some camps, summer camps um, that might be happening. And we've been trying to set up a project for a while, but because of COVID, um, hasn't been really possible but which was to um one thing that we want to do is with um uh basically teens to get to do like a leadership camp where we bring them to um for example ESO to do like a little two-week kind of research project and get um uh, mostly focusing on girls but we might also uh, yeah we'll see how that goes um yeah to do a kind of like leadership camp where they learn about STEM subjects and do a little research project, but that's been up in the air for a long time, just because it's been impossible to plan with all the travel restrictions, but hopefully, yeah, hopefully next year that will be a reality. So yeah, let's um, see. Yeah, exciting. And obviously ESO is a great place to bring people to. It's like a real hub there and there's enough people around to chip in. So that's yeah. exciting. So, uh, and, uh, and, well, William, you just raised your hand. So if you have another question, please go ahead. Yeah, I have no shortage of questions, so I can make this Q&A twice as long. Why not? Um, yeah, um, what I love about this Astronomy Peace Project is that um, it's using science to foster social change, but in fostering peace, um, you're simultaneously promoting science. And one example of that is you're encouraging girls to enter STEM fields. So I was wondering if you, maybe you could talk some more about how your um, science is also being boosted by the aims for social change? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so definitely in the context of, of Cyprus, I mean, I think, um, you know, we have quite bad, um, I think we have a quite poor track record in a lot of things related to um, gender equality. Um, I don't have any statistics off, off the top of my head at the moment, but, you know, that there's, um, well, there's, there's issues with that everywhere, right? But I think also, um, yeah, there are definitely issues there in Cyprus as well. And um, so I think, yeah, a lot of, I don't, you know, there's not a lot of girls going into STEM subjects in Cyprus. So I think that was one of the things when we started the project, um, we, um, you know, were quite a few of the, of the you know, um, people implementing the project early on were women. And that was one of our goals was to kind of show girls in Cyprus that you can, you know, first of all, what is an astronomer? What is an astrophysicist? That was, you know, the first kind of uh, thing we wanted to reach out to, to these um, young girls. And um, so we also, you know, talk a little bit about that and what does it mean to, to be an astronomer and what, what do we do in our day-to-day -day lives? Like we usually have a little chat in the beginning of each, um, when we go into a new school, we have a little chat about that. And uh, yeah, just to get them to see that that is, you know, a viable um, option and that science is really fun and exciting. And we try and of course, make it as interesting as possible um, for them. And yeah, hopefully inspire some of them. I mean, you know, some of the girls are really, uh, you know, there's not, they don't have that many opportunities to, 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 you know, even look through a telescope or, you know, talk to someone who does that kind of career. So I hope that was, yeah, I hope that we- you're, you're the role to, model. You're the role model for the girls. Well, we have not just me. There's also a few other sure, women, um, sure. really fantastic women who work in the project as well. Um, so, yeah, hopefully we've given them uh, some uh, food for thought about that for the future. 
So um, I'd like to ask you another question that, uh, of you that Leo asked in the, the, the comment section, which is, uh, he says, you mentioned in the beginning that you, were also, that you are also addressing climate change with this project. Is that mainly through the pale blue dot perspective, or did you find other links between astronomy and climate education? So how, are, how have you been including uh, climate change into this project? Yeah, so it is mainly, excuse me, it is mainly through the, the pale blue dot um, kind of perspective and framework. Um, we also, I mean, do things like, for example, one of our um, uh, favorite activities that we do very often is um, Earth as a peppercorn, where we, you know, say if the Earth was the size of a peppercorn, what would the other planets, uh, how big would the other planets be, what would the scales be in the solar system? And when we do that one, we often spend quite a while uh, discussing Venus and, you know, bringing in the concept of, you know, greenhouse gases and, and you know, trying to talk a little bit about climate change through that. Um, we also have another activity, uh, which we sometimes do, but with slightly older kids, which is more about um, exoplanets. So that's also another way to talk a little bit about, you know, climate and how that can change and, you know, like how, you know, the, the position of the planet affects um, conditions on Earth. Um, and then also, um, you know, slightly maybe more tangentially is that when one of our activities um, that we do very often, which is, um, I also showed a clip of this in the, in the talk, which is the golden record, we talk about kind of common um, heritage also of things on the island. And one of the things we touch upon always is um, natural heritage. So we talk a lot about, you know, different regions around the island that are of, you know, natural beauty and, you know, talking about, you know, preserving them and that kind of thing. So it's not, you know, that's not the main focus, but we try and bring those perspectives in and, and highlight a bit the fragility of Earth and, you know, how we need to be sustainable to preserve all these things and also in Cyprus, you know, and, and, and talk about that. Um, yeah, but, but it's mainly through the, the kind of pale blue dot um, perspective, I would say. So kids, it sounds like kids are getting an appreciation of <clears throat> not only the large distances between uh, the planets in our solar system, but to exoplanets as well? Are you, do you extend like the peppercorn analogy to like the nearest stars or? Uh, you, the exoplanets one is uh, usually it's called build your own planet. And it, we mm. usually kind of discuss, um, uh, so the way it's done is like you discuss, uh, you bring in the concept of, you know, how many exoplanets have been discovered. And then you talk a little bit about the, why, you know, the, it, trying to imagine the conditions in different exoplanets by first talking a little bit about, you know, the habitable zone and talking about distances to the star and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. And then yeah. they need to kind of imagine their own kind of planet and the conditions that would be on it and then that kind of thing. Interesting. I hadn't thought about this until recently, but unfortunately, when we use the phrase habitable zone, it gives the, the, the misconception that if a planet is there, it's habitable and we can possibly move to it. So. Yeah, yeah, there was a really fantastic <laughs> uh, talk that I saw the other day um, that was mentioning uh, this and I also hadn't thought about that. Yeah, that we need to be careful with the language we use for that in a sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I have lots of questions. Does anyone else have anyone, any questions? That uh, feel free, if, if you have point, at any point you have a question, feel free to raise your hand or type it into the, the chat. Um, I'll follow up with another question that Leo had, and that is, um, <clears throat> can you talk more about how your project is organized internally? And uh, we're interested in learning more about this because it could help us with our, our projects here at A4E. Yeah, so that's a that's a that's a complex one. So no, so the project as it is, um, as I said, uh, is run by two implementing organizations. So one is Galileo Mobile, um, which is a, a group of basically science communicators, astronomers um, that was set up in two thousand and eight. Um, and the other implementing organization is this NGO that's based in Cyprus um, called the Association for Historical Dialogue and Research. So AHDR is, is a registered NGO and, 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 and you know, they have a, uh, that all set up. Um, Galileo Mobile, which is the, the organization that, that I'm part of, um, is not, we're not registered. That was a huge uh, debate that we had many times about whether we should, um, what we should do about that. Um, the problem for us and why we never actually got around to, to registering is that um, when the project started out, uh, most of the people who, who the, the kind of founding members were mostly based in Germany, um, but they were all like early career researchers, so PhDs, uh, mostly PhDs. 
um, if I remember correctly. And then obviously they, they, you know, spread out throughout the world and then, you know, new people came in, for example, I came in in 2014, but, you know, a lot of us are, were, you know, postdocs or new PhD students. And so not really stable in one place. Um, and then there was, we had a lot, quite a few of us were based in Brazil. So we at some point thought about registering there, but then the problem was, of course, you know, if you get funding in Europe, you have to, you know, the, the, the funding situation was a bit complicated. At some point, we did think about doing it in France. I, I was also based in Paris for a couple of years, and there was a couple of other people that were there. Um, so we did actually start a process, but then it got a bit complicated, and we thought, well, we might be moving soon, so is it really worth it? So, yeah, I think for, for I guess, for Astronomers for Planet Earth also, it's difficult because you're such an international um organization that I guess it's it's complicated and each you know country has its own rules about how to register an NGO and that kind of thing so I'd be really interested to hear what what if you found a, a way of making this happen in a more simple straightforward way but um, we had a hard time with it well we haven't yet I mean we've <clears throat> as you as you point out it is an international organization and so you know the big questions arise of you know in what country do you register and how does that hand, you know, affect uh, how you operate in different places? So, so short answer is we don't have a solution yet. Um, so, <laughs> so we'd like to know more. Um, so I'm curious, uh, you know, from your experience, how has that influenced how you talk about climate change uh, with people, especially if it's someone uh, who might be skeptical or doubtful? Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think that's a that's a tough question, right? And I don't I'm not sure that I have the best. Um, you know, I don't I don't think that I've. This is a really I think a lot of people would would like to know the answer of how to best communicate this with people who are skeptical um, to be you know convincing and to to get the message across. I don't think I have um, you know kind of um, the best solution to this, but I guess I think you know as always, it's really important to hear out the other side as well and to to not approach conversations in confrontational kind of, I know it all, let me tell you how it is kind of um, attitude. Um, because, you know, there's, you know, the, the people that are skeptical have, you know, their reasons for, for, for being um, skeptical. And, you know, as, as we know of just by telling people facts doesn't necessarily mean they'll change their mind about it. Um, and I guess, yeah, the, the one one way of going about it, of course, is this thing of trying to create some kind of bond with people, and and to and then people might be more receptive to kind of hearing you out if they get to know you and if they get to see that your, you know, your intentions are not to preach, but you're just you know concerned or or that kind of thing. So, so I think, yeah, I think a lot of yeah, it's it's a difficult question, but I think a lot of it has to do with I think the best way of doing it is to kind of first create those links with people and those bonds with people um, to be able to even start having that conversation, I think. Interesting. Uh, Letha, I see you have your hand up, so please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, thank you. Um, because it's a small group here, I'm taking the liberty of like, not just asking a question, but like being like, thank you so much for doing what you do. And um, I watched your video yesterday and it was just like, Amazing, because um, it really speaks to, I think, the intersection that I want to work in and just seeing that, seeing it sort of presented as an intersection, like, you know, you've got astronomy and world peace, like peace building and climate change, and you've, you've got sort of like women's rights and feminism mixed in there too. And um, like when you vent all those things and it becomes a sort of a, a subject, like, I think that's really exciting. And um I'm a, I'm a science communicator. I am a staff scientist at Canada's second largest science center, Science North. And it's because I'm passionate about those subjects, I am now like sort of the representative staff scientist for astronomy and for climate change. And they keep fitting together in my mind. And I keep talking to students about both of them and like how you were talking about, you know, bringing up the runaway greenhouse effect on Venus and you know, showing them the earth and that idea that like we're on this small fragile, you know, sphere in space. And I think it's been really effective. And I just kind of wanted to share that with you that this is amazing work that you're doing. And I didn't know that the organization like Astronomers for Earth existed. And so I'm just 
super exciting, excited. I'm just kind of, I just wanted to fan. Thank you. <laughs> I don't have any specific questions now, except maybe like, hey, do you ever want to collaborate on anything if it makes sense? Because I really believe in what you're doing. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, I'm, and, and thank you for the work you're doing. I think it's really important. And thank you to astronomers for planet Earth for all the work uh, you guys are doing too. And yeah, thank you. That's really kind. Well, do you do you for... any, any collaboration like internationally? Does that make sense yeah, I mean, for we're... what you're doing or? I mean, so definitely. So, so um, one thing that we um, uh, have been kind of cautious about is not kind of going into context where we, um, you know, I think always having people from the local context that know the situation and, you know, kind of know the, 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 the issues is really important. So, I mean, mm -hmm. we're very happy to definitely like collaborate and bring any expertise and like, you know, share resources, all our resources, um, the, the handbooks that we, we've made um, for the project with all the activities are freely available online and everything. And we're really happy um, to collaborate and come, you know, if and, and in any way that we can help and, and you know, or come and help out there. Um, but I think, yeah, for us, it's been really important to have, I think, people locally also that kind of know the context and can be like, this is what the situation is, this is what we need. Um, and if we can help out in any way, um, you know, then that would be fantastic. I mean, for sure, definitely. I'm realizing in our local context, one of the things where COVID's kind of like, holding it up but we have um so i'm in sudbury ontario and we have um a like a pretty strong indigenous population we also are still dealing with with racism and violence and um i'm i've learned some indigenous astronomy and so like we're having like when we can gather again like we have this plan for like every saturday meeting and how and trying to encourage like indigenous community members um to come out as well as like settler community members and then to actually sort of talk about kind of like you were using it right like as a way of finding that common ground so like we actually made a planetarium star uh, show called under the same stars and you talked about like under the same sky as being that way to bring us together it's like you know, we all grew up here under these same stars and we relate to them and it's that that connection so i think that's a project where i'm having trouble moving forward on it you know it's because it's it's complicated and delicate and so I'd love mm -hmm. to yeah. absolutely but that sounds like a really fantastic project and 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 for sure I mean let's 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 be in touch and, and we can connect after this and I'd, I'd be really happy to hear what you guys are are doing it sounds really amazing well, thank you that's really interesting to <clears throat> to hear about uh William you have your <clears throat> hand up again so if you if you have another question you'd like to ask please do yeah, I mean, as a fellow Canadian, I, I, I think this is particularly appropriate to mention what, um, which, which, what's really uh, important to me. I want to, I'm wondering how I can use your ideas and your approach um, to address certain problems in Canada. One that's been mentioned already is about the, the uh, problems with um, uh, truth and reconciliation with the Indigenous peoples, the, the First Nations peoples. Um, uh, their legends of the night sky form part of their cultures, so it's it's easy to see an astronomical connection there. Um, we can provide activities with them and, and, and groups of people to help them. Uh, it actually helps them uh, recover fragments uh, of their culture by studying the night sky, um, or presenting, you know, or having maybe star parties for, and we can learn about the, how they view the night sky. Um, but. Uh, I'm also wondering how we can use astronomy activities to uh, help encourage consciousness of the uh, uh, of of ecology. Um, old growth forests have been in the news lately in British Columbia, Canada's westernmost province. Um, I, I put in the chat, as a matter of fact, a link to uh, uh, an article that has a picture of an old growth tree that's been cut down and is being carried along the highway, and that's that's gone viral. It's it's. It's amazing that something that uh, basically it's a majestic giant of the forest that's been chopped down and is going to be used for I don't know what wood pellets shingles uh, it's 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 a crime against nature. Um, so how do I adapt your project to such problems of insufficient awareness of these topics and and maybe helping in some way? Yeah, I I mean so. 
well, first, I, I just wanted to um, point out um, if anyone's interested. So um, in Galileo Mobile, we also have a, um, a, a few other projects that have been done in the past um, with indigenous communities. So in particular, um, uh, there was a really fantastic project in Brazil um, called Bravo. And if you look on Galileo Mobile's website, um, there's also um, links to a documentary that we made about, about that um, project. And um, uh, the in part in the pro in part of the project involved um, reaching out to um, one of the indigenous communities of Brazil that had re just recently uh, made contact with. Um, so uh, and a lot of in that part of kind of the project, um, a big part of it was actually uh, they um, members of Galileo Mobile worked with. Um, uh, anthropologist to also record um, the traditions of these indigenous communities related to um, to the night sky and to astronomy and to kind of record their cosmology as well. And of course, in those cases, there was a lot of care being taken in the approach that was taken in doing activities, because of course, um, you don't want to go there and be like, well, let me tell you how things are, you know, and, and, and this is how, you know, uh, yeah, this is our cosmology. Um, so it was always, I think, in Galileo Mobile, we, we, we approach um, projects in a way of a mutual learning experience. Um, so we are also going there to learn as well. Um, and especially in this project that was, um, you know, really, really um, taken on board and we were very careful about that. Um, so that's, that's uh, the, the Bravo expedition. And if you look on Galileo Mobile's website, you can see um, they have a great documentary about that. So I think that's a great resource um, if you're interested also in learning kind of an approach that we took there. Um, and there's also been another um, amazing project of Galileo Mobile that's called Amanar, uh, which is still going on. And in that project, um, uh, we've been working with um, refugees in the Tinduf uh, area um, in, in, in um, uh, Western Sahara. So that's another uh, situation where um, there was a lot of learning to be done before going there and kind of um, appreciating, again, the local contact, context and working with local NGOs um, in kind of implementing this under the same sky um, kind of approach that Galileo Mobile has. Um, and there's also a documentary online about that as well. So if, if you're interested in those kinds of um, resources, um, we have them online uh, on Galileo Mobile's website. And also, the, like I said, the handbooks are all online with the activities. Um, so, and in terms of, you know, more e ecological aspects, I mean, I, I guess, you know, like I said, I think, you know, astronomy, of course, I mean, astronomers for planet Earth will, will you guys, I'm sure, uh, are applying this much more effectively towards really specifically climate change. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of these activities, I think, where talking about, you know, um, uh, talking about the um, planet Earth in the context of the solar system and in the context and, you know, bringing in aspects of, of, of how fragile, you know, our biosphere is and, and, you know, how vast and empty everything else, you know, empty spaces and, you know, how difficult it is to find the right conditions on any kind of other um, planet that we know of so far. Um, I think, I guess, from those perspectives, I would try if you if one were to really want to talk about these kinds of, um, like you say, old growth forests, I would maybe, you know, think of talk about how long it's taken them to, you know, to grow and, and how, um, you know, old they are maybe with respect to to um, our civilization or, you know, with respect to cosmic times and kind of try and put that into perspective. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, I guess, um, kind of taking that um, yeah, pale blue dog maybe approach would be, would be how I would go about it. Yeah, I've taken the link to galileomobile.org slash projects. Mm -hmm. I put it on, in, the, in the chat there for anyone who's interested. Yeah, maybe we can put it also in the, in the comments uh, section of this in case people are interested uh, uh, in them. Yeah. When, when watching this, maybe we can link it up because there's yeah. a lot of great resources there. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure that the, uh, the link to that makes it into the, the description for this video so people have that. Okay. One of the things I think is really important to emphasize is, I mean, of course, we, we talk about, uh, you know, the habitability of the Earth compared to Venus and Mars and, and that, but I think it's also important to compare the habitability of the Earth now 
to what it used to be. You know, that really has only been for the last 10,000 years, uh, you know, an infinitesimally small slice of, of geologic time that the earth has been habitable as we habit it now. You know, that all the things that we take, into, you take for granted as far as uh, agriculture and the, the plants and animals that we rely upon, uh, that's all very, very recent and also, you know, far from guaranteed that it's, it's going to continue to last. And so I think that's another important part of the lesson of the, you know, the Earth's ecosystem. This is that, you know, the Earth will survive uh, no matter what we do to it. The Earth will survive and species will survive. But <clears throat> the Earth, as we inhabit it now, has only been that way for a short time and is, is relatively unstable. So I think that that perspective can help as well. But that's a very good point, Travis. Uh, if you think about Mars, Mars might have been habitable in the, la in, in the past and isn't anymore. Mm -hmm. And maybe Earth will be like that too. Maybe Earth will become so extreme and maybe it's slowly becoming Venus. I don't yeah, know. and there's interesting research in the case that Venus might have once been habitable. You know, that there was, a, that, uh, in, not as far back as we might have imagined, that it did have oceans and, and could have had the conditions. And so... I think this perspective that um, there's no guarantee that a planet will continue to remain habitable uh, is important, but especially habitable in the way we inhabit it. I mean, uh, you know, with climate change, uh, I don't, I haven't, I don't think anyone is really afraid of like humans going extinct, but uh, the earth is already being, or the earth is already being taxed uh, in, you know, in being able to provide the resources necessary for the 7 billion people that are living on it. And uh, so as we change the climate and, and you know, put more pressure on that, already, that system that is already under incredible stress, uh, that is, you know, that is, it's, it's just part of a, a larger problem. Absolutely. Uh, well, I think I have your hand up if you'd like to ask another question or go um, comment on that. So I've definitely like firsthand experienced the power of like the relationship building that happens when you when you meet up in person to look at the stars, right? Just like the automatic sort of sense of awe and the openness, and it's an amazing way to build relationships. Um, and now I find myself like sort of stuck in a digital world. <laughs> and I'm wondering um, if you can point to any projects or models or just things that have, have helped sort of try to build those relationships without the night sky, like right there. Hmm, that's a tough I, question. I, I know some of your work was also done in the in the daytime with students. Like I did see that, but um, but I guess yeah, what I'm asking is like without it, it's absolutely a way to bring people together and be like, yeah, we're here for astronomy and peace and climate mm -hmm. change and equality, you know. Yeah. And it's that that draw and that universal shared thing. But what about now? Like I don't know. In this, in the times of COVID, you mean where everything is yeah. online? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. That is a really great question and, and one that we've definitely um, struggled with, like I said. So, so we, we haven't um, you know, been able to find a way to translate that into the, into the online format where we thought it would really be quite as convincing or the same kind of experience. Um, so yeah, I, I would love to know the answer to that. I mean, you know, of course, um, you know, these kinds of webinars are great and, and they have improved a lot, you know, just accessibility in terms of people being able to, to, to access, you know, events and, and information that they would have not necessarily been able to before. So that's fantastic. Um, but of course, yeah, you're missing that kind of in-person thing, which is, which is also um, difficult to recreate. I mean, yeah, I haven't had, to be honest, like much, I haven't had, I've been to some conferences that have been quite successful as online uh, in online format in the sense that, the way they were structured was um, very different from an in-person conference. It wasn't the kind of one talk after the other. It was um, more, you know, pre-recorded talks and then and focusing really on conversation and, you know, having a Slack channel in parallel where you can chat and that kind of thing. But I don't know that I can say that I, I can't think of a really great example in terms of like bringing people together to discuss um, topics like, you know, climate change or astronomy for peace in terms of, 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 of yeah, these, these kind of events that bring people together rather than and, um, uh, talking about 
just inform informative events rather. Um, but yeah, I don't know, maybe astronomers for, for planet, I don't know if there's been some, some good examples that maybe you can point to in terms of bringing people together in this online world that you found particularly successful. Well, when it comes to online experiences, I think we're all still very much learning how to do it. Um, you know, the, the analogy I like to use is uh, that of television. When, tele when television was first created, when the technology first uh, began, uh, no, one, no one knew how to do TV shows. And so they just did radio shows on television because they knew how to do radio shows. And it took time for the, uh, the potential of the technology to make itself clear. And I think that's where we are uh, with, with this online experience um, that we, we don't know the best ways to do it. And so um, unfortunately, many people see that and they think, oh, I don't like the online experience because it's, it's inferior. And you know that's true in the sense that having people face to face is always going to be a, you know a more intimate experience and a, and a better opportunity, especially to develop relationship and rapport, which is really what I think uh, you know we're, we're trying to do to break down those barriers and develop those relationships. And um, but the but when it comes to the t doing things online. We still just don't know how to, especially develop relationships as well. Um, you know, having informal experiences online, there are things that you can facilitate. And and one of the things I just like to point out is just what we're doing right now. I mean, this wouldn't be possible otherwise, right? You know, and uh, as much as I miss the face-to-face -face experience, I really don't miss airplanes. I don't miss hotels. I don't miss you know, air, you know, airline food, that sort of thing. And, you know, so I think that's going to be the challenge for us is, is to figure out how to use the technology. Um, but one of the things that you said, Francesca, that really resonated with me, and I think is so true, especially for the kind of work that you do, it really is about building relationships. And um, one of the things that I think uh, astronomers have difficulty with, especially because we are, we are often in the role of educators is uh, we're used to talking, uh, but we're not as good at listening. And so, you know, and that's something I've noticed in myself is just trying to be a good listener, really be in the moment, hearing what someone is saying to me, trying to get to know them better, ask good follow-up questions, and not just trying to gotcha them, you know, like lead them into a trap where I can nail them with some, you know, piece of knowledge that shows that I'm right and they're wrong. But building that relationship of trust and respect and, you know, maybe you don't change someone's mind completely in an experience, but if you can show respect to someone and start to build that relationship, then, then that's something you can build upon. And maybe the next experience someone has, you know, with astronomers or with a climate, on a climate change topic, um, they'll feel more comfortable with exploring that space. I think especially with climate change, I think most people understand something's going on and they don't quite understand what it is and they don't know who to listen to. Um, and so building those relationships can be the first start to helping them develop what their relationship will be with, with what it is. Um, we're approaching the hour. And so I wanted, uh, William, you have your hand up. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let you ask, what will probably be our last question. Um, so go ahead. It's not really a question. I, I just want to, I don't want to jump in there somewhere. I was trying to figure out where to jump in when you're talking about TV and, and, and oh, okay. and TV, you didn't know how to use TV in the old days. And, and the truth is TV was underestimated because there was, for example, this famous debate between, uh, one of the, it was the first presidential debate, I think, between uh, Nixon and, uh, and Kennedy. And people didn't uh, uh, appreciate the importance of it. And yet, yet on TV, Kennedy looked much better than Nixon, and, and it really helped sway that election, apparently. So I think we're in the early days, as you said, of using online communications, and it hasn't seen its uh, full potential realized, is basically what I wanted to say. Okay, yeah, well, that's, that's a good point, yeah. And, and I think that's where we are with, with online technology. And I think it's, I think it's just part of human nature. Um, as things change, um, at first we see what things aren't, and it takes time to see what they can be. And, and I think like um, 
like if you move to a new city, the first thing you notice is, uh, you know, it doesn't have your friends, it doesn't have your favorite restaurant, there's all these things it doesn't have, but over time you get to know the place and, and you start to learn what it does have and you get to appreciate it for what it is. And I think, um, I think those are all the changes we're going to go through, not only the virtual experience, but these other changes that we're doing not only to address climate change, but just as things evolve. So for example, with electric cars, you know, for first they seem kind of weird, right? Because we're so accustomed to internal combustion engines. And after you learn a little bit more about it and you experience electric cars, you realize, wow, you know, internal combustion engines are a really dumb idea. I mean, you know, they're really dangerous, right? You turn it on in your garage and it's going to kill you. You know, it, you know, you feel weird after you inhale the exhaust. It's such a, you know, uh, it's so expensive. It's so, you know, such a pain to go to the gas station uh, to fill up the tank when you, you know, you don't have to do that electric car. There's all these moving parts and they're constantly breaking. Um, and after a while, your perspective changes and you realize, wow, you know, the internal combustion engine is kind of the weird thing, actually, in the electric cars, it makes a lot more sense. And so uh, I think those are the transitions that uh, that people will go through. Well, we've come up on an hour, and so I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, Francesco. This has been really interesting and really inspirational. Um, it just makes me want to get out there and, and do even more. So um, thank and you I all. And yeah, thank you. And I want to thank everyone who took time to join us today. And uh, I think everyone here is probably a member for Astronomers for Planet Earth. But if you're not, um, you can find our website. It'll be in, in the chat session. And, um, and uh, thank you all. We will hopefully see you all again soon. If you're interested in Astronomers for Planet Earth, you can learn more at our website, astronomersforplanet.earth, and on social media as well. If you would like to be notified about future talks and events, please follow and join us.